Well, today completed our fifth bowl practice. Uh, we, uh, today was our first live practice, live tackling. Uh, it feels good to get in some live tackling. Uh, you know, we haven't been able to do that um, very often, so it's, it's nice to be able to go into uh, a practice session and uh, compete and, and uh, you know, have some live uh, scrimmage action. <clears throat> so that went well. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have tomorrow as a kind of a uh, meet and lift day. Uh, guys have moved out of the dorms, and uh, so it's a transition day for us. Um, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll kind of treat as game week, um, as, a, as a traditional game week. So it'll be a heavy install uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Then we'll send the kids home, and, and then as we report to uh, the bowl site, we'll kind of duplicate that uh, down there. So uh, today was kind of that last day where we you know, got a little bit of everything in, got some of the young guys in there, got some scrimmaging in, um, got a little bit of Ohio State work in as well. Um, but now this is as we transition out of the dorms, now that school is over for our guys, um, you know, these, these uh, next seven or eight practices are, are strictly uh, Ohio State um, game planning. So uh, with that, we'll open up to questions. We got good ones today? Well, this is a real good one, maybe. Um, but what, what, <coughs> I, I, what do you mean, maybe? Well, I'm, I'm lacking confidence. God, <laughs> I'm going to make you feel more confident about it the way I answer it. Let's okay. go. Okay, all right. Jerron Jones and Smythe. You were encouraged at the early signs from them. What are you seeing from those guys now? And are you convinced that they can help you? I think that's a terrific question, first of all. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jerron, I think, has done a really good job. Um, you know, we've increased his reps each and every day. I, I think that that's what I like about him the most. He sh he's uh, shown no ill effects of the knee, um, which, you know, obviously the – the first concern is as, as you go back to back days, you're looking for any kind of a fusion or swelling in the knee, nothing of that kind. So it's really just been, you know, adding reps. So I think where he's really going to help us is certainly, you know, obviously first and second down, but he can help us on third down. Um, his, his push inside is, is undervalued um, in terms of what he can do internally and, and his, his physical push to the pocket. So. He, he's going to help us, um, and and you know Durham Smythe is is a guy that does a lot of jobs well for us, and um, he's he's shown himself to to come back in in good physical conditioning, um, and the knee and shoulder are really solid. So so both of those guys will will s certainly impact what we do. I know you missed Tony Piper a big chunk of the '09 season, I think. Have you ever had somebody miss this much time and come back and actually play in a game for you? Well, um, you know, to, to have somebody out this long um, at the defensive line position, um, I think is a little bit different than the quarterback position. You worry at the quarterback position with timing, uh, the elements of timing. There is no timing element when, it, when you're talking about a defensive lineman. It's, it's really volume, uh, conditioning, because his physical prowess is still there. He's a big dude. <laughs> and so, you know, he's, he's kept his strength. He's kept his conditioning. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really just about his volume and how long he can go. Quarterback, you'd be a lot more. Like, if, this, if we were talking about Malik, I think what we'd be more concerned with is his timing. With Jerron, the fact that he's been able to make such great strides coming off of his injury, what does that speak to the level of maturity that he's gained as he's kind of gone through the program with the ability to take the plan, stick to it, and now maybe see results this year? Well, you know, I think there's been a lot of people involved here. You know, Jerron, first of all, has to take responsibility for his, his own body. You know, so he's got to live right. He's got to do the right things. Um, Rob Hunt has done a great job with his uh, piece in the rehab and Paul Longo. I mean, those two. Without, without their work, I don't think we are where we are. Um, but I think the maturity element of anybody um, is important in overcoming an injury that he had during the season. Um, 
and, and, and I would tell you that generally speaking in my time as a head coach, those guys that are able to come back during the season have got to be responsible young men because they have to be the ones that are showing up at treatment. You can't go get them, okay? They got to be there. They got to be there on time because we can't run and go get them. They, they, they have to be the ones that show the initiative and he's been really good to work with. If Rob was here right now, he would say that Jerron did a great job all year of being at treatments and you have to be mature. You have to um, grow up and, and he's done that both on and off the field. He's been moving around. He's not um, at full go yet, um, but you know we're hopeful that as we continue to move through next week, that you know we get closer and closer. But he's not taking um, meaningful reps yet. Coach, you talked about Jones. Uh, Y'all may get him back. Ohio State has lost first Adolphus Washington, and maybe Tommy Shutt, their other starting defensive tackle. Uh, what's the impact what, when you hear those two kinds of news? I saw what you said about. Washington last week, they'll just plug another guy in there, but then they lose their other guy. What's just what are your what's well? Your you know, I, again, I, I I know that their depth and personnel is always uh, is very good, but you know, you at, at this time of the year, you don't want to lose frontline guys, certainly, and we would feel the same way about you know our guys to lose frontline guys. You know, you're you're always looking um, to put your best guys out uh, front in, in games like this, so. Um, they've got some flexibility with personnel, um, but you know certainly I think we'd feel the same way if we lost a, you know, a Sheldon Day. You know, th those are those are losses that other guys are going to have to pick up their play. Um, but they have other players on their uh, on that side of the ball that are that that can definitely fill in for them. Coach, you got two legendary programs going at each other. What does this mean? for you as a coach to face an Ohio State team? What are you telling your players? How special is this, uh, this game? And secondly, what keeps you up at night? Ezekiel Elliott or Joey Bosa for Ohio State? Um, well, first of all, I, I think that, that you know, as a coach, we want to play in these kinds of games. These are the ones that we prepare for. You know, if you look at our schedule, um, you know, we want to play these kinds of games at Notre Dame. Um, you know, we prepare for this opportunity to play, a, um, you know, a tradition-rich program like Ohio State. Um, you know, the defending national champs adds obviously something to it. Being in the Midwest, we recruit against them, adds something to it. Um, I think as it relates to a particular player, both of them are terrific players, both offensively and defensively. What makes them a, a great team is there's more than just one or two of them. Um, you know, I think, you know, quarterback, offensive line, Ezekiel Elliott, if he doesn't have a very good offensive line, Ezekiel Elliott, I think, you know, we all know that when LSU played Alabama, uh, we were all talking about Leonard Fournette for the Heisman. And then we found out, well, that defensive line against Alabama is, uh, is pretty good. They can shut down anybody. So I really think it's Ohio State's program, what Urban does. Um, they're, they're just a really good football team, and, and, and I think that that's what scares you the most. Thanks. Brian, I think we've talked about this in the past, but what are some of the, what are some of the adjustments that you've made in, during your career in terms of bowl preparation, what you can do, what you can't do, what you should or shouldn't do? Well, I, I think, you know, early on, one of the things is that we weren't really able to tackle. Um, I, I'm a big believer that, you know, with the time off that you have, you, you have to have live opportunities. You've got to go out and, and create live opportunities for your team and tackle and bang around. And in our first few years, we weren't able to do that. Uh, we've got better depth that we can go out and do those kinds of things. So I would say that that's one thing that was specific to this football program here at Notre Dame, that we can do that now. Um, I'd say secondly, um, you know, making sure that, um, that the players are um, understanding that this is about what your attitude is in this bowl game. It's really about your attitude. Are you committed to this game? Uh, uh, if you're not committed to playing the game, just let us know, because I'll go home early and we'll spend time with our family. 
if you're really committed to this game. In other words, you don't have one foot out the door because you, you're, you're worried about your draft status and you know, you're, you're thinking about other things. If you're fully committed to this game, we'll be fully committed to you. So I think it's really about what the attitude is and really creating a, a great you know, morale for the game. And I think that's, those are the things that I've learned. And, and in terms of preparation, do you you have to remind yourself it's a marathon, not a sprint. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, you know, today we went an hour and 20 minutes, right? That's been the longest practice that we've had in our first five. So no more than 90 minutes through our first five practices, and we won't go probably past an hour and 40 minutes. So these will be short, fairly intense, fast paced. Um, but we're not, you know, we're at a point now where, you know, we're not spending 20 minutes on individual technique. You know, we're right into planning. Yeah. The season. Have you adjusted anything since the, the national championship game three years ago? No, only the only change in that is that we we practiced um, a lot more against each other uh, where I couldn't really do that um, prior to because we were so thin in numbers. So we've worked against each other, good versus good, one versus one speed. Uh, so we've gotten a lot more speed one versus one uh, since that time. So the lesson is build better depth and then you can do without, that. Without question. Yeah, without question. Yep. Brian, in the past, you, uh, speaking to the attitude that they have to have going into the game, you've spoken throughout the year about how this year's group, there's so many leaders, the mentality has been so solid. Have you seen that sort of carry over in these weeks as well, that it's been a, maybe a different approach or a more focused approach to this preparation? Well, it's been great. I, I'll give you an example. I mean, just little things, right? You know, every year we put the names on the back of the jerseys. The seniors came to me and said, Coach, we don't want names on the back of our jerseys. You know, we're Team 127. You know, it's, um, you know, just little things like that where it's just been a continuation of, you know, the same demeanor, the same thought process, the same, you know, we're, we're about a team focus. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to stay out of their way at this point and, and not mess it up because they, they clearly have a direction that they want to go and how they want to play. Um, so um, we have kind of, um, I think, picked up where we left off. And, you know, they, they know they've got to play well uh, and execute well. But uh, as, as, as it relates to their, uh, who they are, uh, that hasn't changed at, at, at any time during the year. I had a question about Mike Sanford as well. I think when you brought him in, you said one of the reasons that, that you wanted him here was that you guys didn't have a history, that he would question things or challenge you on things. How has that kind of played out throughout the season and also during this time when you can kind of readjust or relook at things? Well, I think it's been a, a great um, synergy on offense. I think, you know, you know, we're, you know, statistically, you know, if, if you put any credence into stats, which, you know, you can move stats any way you'd like them, but, um, you know, I think we're top five in, you know, rushing attempts. We're top five in completion, you know, yardage per attempt. You know, we're top five in, you know, a lot of categories if you take out some of the option teams, you know. So, you know, he, he's, he's been involved in that. Mike Dembrock and, and he have worked extremely well together. And I've kind of, you know, overseen that synergy uh, on the offensive side of the ball. So uh, his impact has been you know, it felt there, and uh, but I, but I think, and I said this earlier. I, I think where um, he, he's probably been most valuable is the development of the quarterbacks. Coach, when you look at the teams you played this year, is there, when you look at the scheme against Ohio State, are there teams that you've played this year where you think Ohio State matches up similar to them, so that you can sort of get an idea of how Ohio State will play the game? Yeah, I think there's some similar uh, traits offensively uh, to Clemson. Uh, in terms of what they do offensively. Um, you know, the backs are very similar. Um, you know, there are some similarities at the quarterback position. Um, you know, I like Ohio State's offensive line maybe a little bit better. Um, but I, I would say there's some sim similarities there. Um, defensively, um, you know, they remind me a little bit more of a Michigan State, you know, uh, they play like a Pittsburgh, but they have better personnel than Pittsburgh. Um, you know, so there's some teams that we played this year that, you know, we kind of say, all right, they look like this and they're, they function like that. But I would say offensively, uh, personnel-wise, like Clemson and defensively, uh, they remind us a lot like a, a Michigan State defense. Brian, in the past you kind of had 
this time to find some, uh, I guess, diamonds in the rough coming up. You had CJ Procise you brought up in December after these practices, Durham Smythe. With five practices, have you had the time to find anybody that's really impressed you um, that maybe wasn't on the varsity? Um, you know, I don't think we've given anybody that much time, you know, that, that, that they could just, you know, kind of rise up above anybody. Um, you know, I, I, we still really like what we're seeing from Miles Boykin. He's gotten a little bit more, you know, opportunity to go out there and compete. He's long, he's athletic, uh, attacks the football. You can see where he's going to be a, you know, really, really, you know, prominent player in our offense, uh, like what he's doing. Um, you know, I think defensively, um, Nick Watkins continues to, to come on. You know, I think he's, he's going he's gonna to have a, a big year for us. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with the progress that he's made. Those two guys kind of flashed for us the last couple of days. Like yeah, it's just confidence, you know, just gaining more confidence, um, you know, each and every day. He makes a couple of good plays, and, and then we don't see him for a little bit. And, and I think that's just confidence, you know, and I think it's starting to come on. And, and um, looking forward to seeing him, you know, really grow. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're going to see a lot from him. Is it to the point where he's seriously challenging Devin Butler for the other um, yeah, I think Devin's playing really well. I mean, I think Cole Luke uh, is being challenged. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think those three guys are, are doing a really good job right now of challenging each other. You know, I think all three of them we've put in a, in a competitive situation. Um, and uh, I think we're going to continue to keep the, um, the heat on them, so to speak, to, to keep competing. Um, because I think it brings out the best in them. Staying on cornerbacks, is Kamari Russell, is he still eligible for a fifth year, to your knowledge? Well, he has to, he has to be cleared through the NCAA. Yeah, so. Um, what reason is there that he has to go through the state? Is there a question about whether the 2014 season counts? Correct. That's correct. And why would it not count? Well, the, the, whether his eligibility uh, during that year was um, taken away, you know, they, they could take that year of eligibility away as a, a uh, penalty. So that's, that's the NCAA. So we'd have to appeal that. Just switching gears on a topic, the Showtime um, shows and all. I mean, looking back on it, is that something, it seems that you know, recruits are talking more about it. It's obviously made you more visible, I mean, visible, not visible necessarily. But, um, okay. Maybe so. Yeah. But, you know, if you had to do it over again, yes. would you continue to do it? And it, did it get what you wanted out of it as far as displaying what Notre Dame is? Yeah, look, I, I think for, for those that um, were not Notre Dame fans, um, I don't think it moved them off that. Um, ledge, uh, but for those that didn't know much about our program, we wanted to open up the program to them and give them an opportunity to see who we are and what we're about. I think it, I think it definitely um, was a positive thing for us. Um, look, it was my decision to to bring the cameras in because I felt our program was at a point where this is who we are. We're we're not changing. This is what you see is what you get. So um, it, it was a calculated decision to um, allow those cameras to come in and take a look at who we were without, you know, um, being scripted. And whatever happened, happened. Um, and it's, and it's, um, there's some good things that happened and there were some, um, you know, not great things that happened. But w I wanted them to be able to portray and show who we were. And, um, you know, from what I hear, uh, it's been a positive experience for those that have watched the show. And, and um, I know from the recruits, they, they liked it because they got a chance to see a lot more of the program that they wouldn't normally see. Have you seen an uptick from recruits as far as not just necessarily the 16 class, but maybe 17? Here, here's what I know. From, from talking to uh, our coaches, uh, they believe that 
it has been um, a positive thing in the recruiting uh, element. We didn't, I didn't go into it with this mastermind um, plan of let's bring Showtime in here and help recruiting. Um, but the residual effect has certainly uh, been a positive thing. Would it serve the same purpose from your perspective? I don't think it would. I don't think it would. Um, if I, I would, I would do it for one time, knowing now what I I know about how it's been a positive thing. I would do it over again from that perspective, but. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bring him back in for a second year. Coach, you made a good comment a while ago. Y'all are who you are now, and stuff. And I, I was talking with Urban Meyer about this the other day uh, when he was thrust into being a head coach for the first time at Bowling Green in the MAC. He kind of like built it from almost nothing. He, he'd never been a head coach before. What did you learn at Grand Valley State and then in, in the MAC at Central Michigan that helped you mold, I guess, who you are now? And yeah. how did that, you know, being sort of in a as Urban said, everybody in the Mac is almost the same size, and it's almost, almost all about coaching and culture and things like that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I really think it's getting your um, – the everybody's got a couple of really good players. I think it's getting your average players to play above their mean um, and, and developing those players. and and. In the Mid-American Conference, you've got a boatload of those guys, and those are the guys that you've got to bring up. You've got to fill them with confidence. You've got to fill them with a belief that at times they're better than they really are. And then you've got to do a great job of developing them. And, and that's what I learned at Grand Valley State, um, and that's what I learned at Central Michigan, is that you've got to get your middle-of-the-pack guy to play above his mean. Because you're going to have a those guys cancel out, you know. Um, maybe Ronnie Stanley and Joey Bosa play to a tie. Maybe they don't, but you know, you hope that that maybe that's the case from 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 our perspective. Um, and then those other guys have got to step up across the board. That's what I learned. And you, 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 in other words, you see yourself falling back on some of those lessons. I mean, what was the what was the toughest thing about becoming a head coach? What was the toughest thing you had to learn your, yourself as far as administration, whatever you want to call it? I think probably uh, consistency in messaging and staff development, you know, picking the right staff and surrounding yourself with, with the right staff members that shared a, uh, a similar vision for what you wanted to accomplish. Um, and, and I think in the Mid-American Conference where you're dealing with you know, such a, a transit, you know, you're turning over coaches, you know, all the time that, that you have to bring in guys that share a similar philosophy. Um, and, and then, um, you know, make sure that they're in it for, for why you're in it, you know, developing your players. And so that shared philosophy was probably the thing that I learned in the Mid-American Conference that, that I carry with me here. Um, now we're in a better position where we can retain um, but the shared philosophy still has to be um, at the center of, of what we do in staff development. <coughs> Kaiser, uh, do you, can you sense right away whether a quarterback has it or not, meaning he seemed to really step into the moment when he had to, and then fourth quarters this year, he seemed to be, at least my observation, I'm in Columbus, Ohio, but he yeah. seemed to be pretty good in fourth quarters. What does that tell you, I guess, about a quarterback? Yeah, right. So. Um, we weren't like totally sold on on his um, his his physical skills. Like in combines, he was okay. He wasn't great. Uh, he threw the ball a bit inconsistently. Um, he was a little off at times. He's a bit of a long lever kid, um, and so we had to go see him play a couple of times. And every time we saw him play, he mounted fourth quarter drives. I mean, he just had a, a way about him. And so when we offered him, we offered him on that premise, that he had that kind of, you know, I can't put my finger on it, but the guy just gets it done late. Uh, now, he had all this physical ability that hadn't shown itself yet. Um, and then when we put him in the game against Virginia and I looked at him and, and you know, I was obviously, feeling at that time that 
you know, we got to put this kid in the game. <laughs> this doesn't look good. He looked a lot more confident than I did. And, and that's kind of when I knew we, we had a kid that was going to be okay. Anything else? All right. Good. Thanks. Thanks